Ajuros. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Did anyone notice that the conductor abandoned the podium <laughs> and was playing the piano? <laughs> Greetings to all. And it's so good to be here. And I mean that in, in all aspects. It's good to be here. It's good to be here for our live stream of Aesthetically Speaking Music, ASM. And uh, we want to welcome all of you that have chosen to join us on 
YouTube and those of you that have also cho chose to join us on Zoom. You know, we welcome all of you and what a blessing it is to have you uh, here with us uh, this evening. I'm gonna start before I go into any, uh, I wanna introduce our staff. You know, we have a, a remarkable, and that means an equal staff. We have Sister Ilham Tamet, and we have Juan Cardoso. Ladies first, go ahead, Ilham. Are you here, Sister? Uh just one second. Maybe it's my fault. Try now. Yeah. No. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Good evening. It's not your fault, Hoan. It's me. I just muted myself and I, I cannot be back. That is why I could not talk. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, greetings to everybody and welcome to this session. And I hope it will be uh, amazing and interesting. Uh, I think it is. I think it is. And you will see, inshallah. Okay. Juan Cardoso. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. You know, those of you who are on YouTube, those of you who are here with us on Zoom. And uh, I'm very glad that we are doing this session. Uh, me and Ralph, uh, you know, uh, in ASM in general with our seekers, we've discussed this theme many times and it has a lot of ramifications and things to talk about. And of course, tonight is just an introduction to this theme. Uh, maybe we can do other live streams like this, other sessions like this on the same topic because it's not just a matter of talking about the name classical music or the name art music or the name music theory, which will be the terms that will be in discussion this night. It's not about the name, it's not just about the names, it's about the implication of these names in a musician's career, you know, in our daily life, in our common sense perception of what is what it is to do good music or, you know, <laughs> to create these comparisons and hierarchies. And just to talk uh, real quick about the two songs that we played, uh, we call it the gathering music, which is for people to just settle in and uh, be in the mood. Uh, of course, Ruff uh, will, talk, uh, will say something about them as well. But the first one is by a classical composer and now it's classical is the correct time because he's from the classical period of of the uh, uh, 1800s to 1900s, you know, and uh, his name is, uh, pardon my French, <laughs> but it's Joseph Boulogne Chevalier de Saint Georges. He was born in the Guadeloupe Islands here in the American continent, and it, it uh, this is a or was a French colony, and. He's an amazing guy, you know, he composed many symphonies, concertos, uh, and he was a black man, you know, born in, in this colony, but he was from a, a privileged family. Uh, you know, uh, his father has some conditions and so on. And, but he was also uh, like a fancy championship, you know, the <laughs> sword sports, and he fought in the French Revolution. Uh, Re Revolution. So he, he's this uh, amazing figure that almost no one knows about, and he has a great impact in the classical musical scenario. You know, people uh, also always compare him to Mozart and so on. And the second piece. Uh, is an orchestra from Bahia here in Brazil, where I'm from. I'm in Rio, uh, but this orchestra is from Bahia, and they are an uh, incredible social project who also uh, use some of the methods of the Simon Bolivar Orchestra uh, from Venezuela, you know, and is playing with the instruments and dancing with the instruments and doing this choreography, and people coming to the stage to dance. It's a way to 
proposed all other kinds of uh, experiences in concert halls in these places which are very serious usually and they're playing Chico Chico no Fubá, which is a, like a Brazilian standard, a Choro a standard. Uh, it's one of the most famous uh, Brazilian music of all times, you know. Uh, and it's an amazing orchestra. I had the opportunity to meet their to uh, their conductor uh, once, you know, in a orchestra convention here in Rio. And they are just amazing project and work. But yeah, that's it for now. Uh, do you want to uh, talk about uh, these these videos, Ralph? Yes, um, I want to add one more thing. You know, um, <clears throat> about Saint George, he had a white father and a, a an African mother. The father took him to to France, and he wanted to put him in a school. I, I, there's a really incredible. Uh, film about uh, St. George that some people, have, I, I'm sure some of you uh, have had a chance to see. I know I enjoyed it. And I knew about him before just from doing research and saying, well, you know, well, who is this guy? Who, you know, I, his name was mentioned like in one sentence in some of the music history books. And I said, well, who is this guy? So it made me want to do research. And then I found out all these wonderful things about him. What an incredible uh, violinist he was. What an incredible composer, equestrian, swordsman. He fought in the, as you said, he fought in, in, in the French Revolution as well. So, I mean, what a life that he had. And, and I should say he was loved by many uh, in France after he stayed a while and was vilified as well. Um, let me I would like to, before I go any further, I would like to read our um, uh, ASM, Aesthetically Speaking, vision statement, because I think this is important, especially when we're in a, in a uh, period like we're getting ready to cover now, or I should say the music that we will be talking about, the musical theories. This is what makes, aesthetically speaking, what it is. We don't just sit up and play records, you know, popular songs off of the, you know, uh, whatever is popular at that time. But we also talk about issues, you know, how important naming is, how important, you know, it is when somebody gives you a name. Who gives you that name and why do they call you that? You know, and it, it, it scatters into music and how we listen to music, how we absorb music and embrace music. Somebody told us that it was classical music, which made me go and, and, and look at the um, definition of classical, which I'll get into in just a minute, but I do want to read our mission statement, our vision statement really quickly. The vision for ASM has a multi-layered purpose to incorporate and bring attention to the creative and ever evolving musical cultures of African and African diasporic music. ASM allows people throughout the globe through listening, research and technology to experience the historical, aesthetic, educational and therapeutic values in music for all people. Let me say this really quickly. The three of us are on different continents right now. Ilham is in France, Juan is in Rio, and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. How about that? At any rate, the vision of ASM will be valued by future generations, we pray, as it helps to enlighten and educate underserved communities on the cultural values of musical expressions and its significance through videos, in interviews, historic references, and discussions, ASM, aesthetically speaking, music will attract listeners and seekers. We call those of you, those that come on our, our, our station here, seekers, because we're all seekers, I should say, because we're all seeking knowledge throughout the globe. The vision of ASM is to bridge generations that seem to be separated only by choice, by creating platforms in communities, schools, nursing, and convalescent facilities and 
correctional institutions. This is done through the therapeutic, educational, and aesthetic values instilled by the creators and those who continue to bear the cultural tradition. This is our vision statement. Before I go any further, and I do, this is some, one of the things that we we like we have to do, or I I have chosen to do this with our uh, aesthetically speaking music. I want to acknowledge some of the very famous um, ancestors that have recently transitioned. Um, one of them is Albert Kumba. They call him Tutti Heath the great drummer, the last of the Heath brothers, um, passed away yesterday. What a great, 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 and one of the funniest people that you could ever imagine. He has some really incredible um, interviews that he has done online. If you get that opportunity to, to listen to them, you'll laugh and you'll also understand that he's played with everybody from Dexter Gordon to Yusef Latif to Thelonious Monk you name it, and he has played music with them. Uh, what an incredible brother, you know. Uh, we got a chance to do music in Los Angeles, and, you know, he will be sorely missed, but I do want to acknowledge his transition. And also from Detroit, Michigan, uh, the poet and activist John Sinclair. Those of you that know about John Sinclair and the, 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 path that he took trying to legalize marijuana for real. That's why it's legal in Detroit, in Michigan, I should say, and other places is because John paid paid a price for that. They put him in, in Marquette prison, 900 miles or whatever it is from Detroit for two joints. Think about that. And then they had a benefit concert, Stevie Wonder, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, the contemporary jazz quintet, quartet, and others, people came to raise money to free John Sinclair, which is the song that John Lennon wrote about John Sinclair. He was a very dear, dear friend of mine. You know, um, they, they were very kind to me, John was. Um, we got a chance to do concerts while he did his his poetry, I'm talking about Charles Moore and myself, and we we opened up at UCLA's Royce Hall, and he did the poetry and we did the music, just the two of us, and we opened up for the great Cecil Taylor. So that was one of the wonderful things that that um, that uh, remembrances of John Sinclair, and John Sinclair for those that may not know, wrote a book called Guitar Army. Check that out if you're able to. You know, what an incredible person he was and an activist of the highest order, or they said, should say the 10th power. So we're gonna go on and uh, Juan did announce what our gathering music was and you know, the, the young people in the orchestra from Bahia I get a kick out of them whenever I see them because they represent to me what doing music is all about. Not only playing the music, but dancing to the music, the rhythm of the music. You know, we heard the, the, uh, the uh, orchestra of young black children doing St. George's music. How incredible is that? So we shall continue on with some interviews by some very important people that will bring some controversial questions, we hope, from our audiences of seekers. And if you want to start off what, with uh, what we call 12 tone, let's go. Yeah. Go ahead. So, you yeah, we, uh, we're going to basically react, comments, and uh, do our insert, uh, inserts about two videos. One is tw uh, from the channel 12 Tone, which is wow. a music researcher and uh, uh, someone who who is a music theorist. And the other one is also a very famous uh, YouTube uh, YouTuber, you know, uh, Adam Neely. He has a channel about music. He has a Berkeley degree uh, and 
He is a bass player and do contents about music. And he did this outstanding research. And uh, uh, he invites Dr. Philip Yu uh, to talk about. And, uh, and he's going to explain everything in the views. And I'm not going to be very long. But basically, we're going to talk about this, these two videos and these terms, you know, uh, classical music, which, uh, which, as in art in general, classic is a period as we have uh, Renaissance, Renaissance, Baroque, classical, Romantic, uh, modern. And so academically is wrong to say classical music. So they've been replacing this name uh, for art music. And the first video is about this, is also saying the problems about the concept of art music. We're not going to play the, the whole video or, or even the second, they are very long, but we really encourage you to watch the whole thing. They are very insightful. Uh, and the second one is more focused on the uh, concept of music theory or what we used to call, what we, uh, we still call music theory and why this represents some very specific thing. So yeah, can I, I can I can I add this one really quickly? Arayame, thank you very much. Um, he also mentioned another uh, great person that has transitioned, and that's Gilan Kane, the co-founder of the incredible, incredible ensemble, the Last Poets. So we do want to to acknowledge our ancestors. That that is you know otherwise we wouldn't be here if it weren't for our ancestors, you know, who are still praying for us and still taking us forward. So mm -hmm. I just want to thank you, uh, Adeyami. I, I'm very grateful for that that reminder, brother. Um, okay, Juan, would you go ahead and start the interviews? Okay. And if you have any questions or yeah, comments, please. please put them in the chat so we can have discussions on what we have right now. All right, mm -hmm. peace. So the first is twelve tone. The, the the title is the worst genre of music. That said, while these movements were all pretty different, it is possible to trace a sort of evolution through their musical philosophies. Sometimes we want to refer not to a specific moment in time, but to the entire history of the tradition, and that's what the term art music lets us do. It's a way of setting aside the concerns of any particular period and categorizing them by their shared cultural origins, which is useful, but implying that what makes those origins unique is that they alone represent the pursuit of great art is garbage. It's nonsense. Stop saying it. But if it's so bad, where did it come from? Well, like most things wrong with modern musical discourse, we can trace this back to 19th century Germany. Or actually, let's go back a bit further. For much of European history, the main way of categorizing music was by function. You had drinking songs, worship songs, dance songs, fancy dance songs, you get the picture. Point is, these cultures didn't have a strong sense of what Dr. Lydia Gare calls the work concept. This is the idea that a piece of music exists as an abstract work, separate from the specific context of its performance, and prior to the late 18th century, it wasn't really a thing in Europe, at least not in any form we'd recognize today. Obviously that changed, but why? Well, like any major cultural shift, the development of the modern work concept was influenced by all sorts of factors, but according to Dr. Matthew Gelbart in his book The Invention of Folk Music and Art Music, one of the biggest reasons was the rise in nationalism. Across Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century, there was an increased interest in establishing unified national identities, and if music was going to be a part of that, then we needed to care less about a song's function and more about its origin. If you can figure out who did a thing first, that tells you who it belongs to. It lets you identify the kinds of music that are a part of your national heritage. This focus on origin led to a new set of categories. On the one hand, you have vernacular music. This is music that's collectively owned by the entire culture. It has no single author, and new artists can take and modify it as they see fit. Like, take London. Very good. Five fifty three. We will be skipping around to hear different parts of these of these uh, these lectures because we hope that it will elicit uh, comments from our from our seekers from our listeners. Um, 
Thank you. Let's let's move forward. of art music arose to describe these sorts of composers and their supposedly visionary works, and it gained in popularity throughout the Romantic period, eventually incorporating older composers like Bach, whose works seemed to fit that mold as well. But if art music is the cultivation of a vernacular tradition, then we need to acknowledge that that's happened in more places than just Europe. Like, take jazz. Jazz grew out of the vernacular music of the blues through the tradition of ragtime, and over the last century became more formalized, structured, and individual thanks to figures like Louis Armstrong, Billie Holiday, and John Coltrane. It's not the exact same trajectory as European art music and it still has a different relationship with the work concept, but overall the story is pretty recognizable, and yet when we say art music we rarely mean jazz. But the idea that jazz should count as art music has already been around for decades, so let's try a more controversial example. Hip-hop. Hip-hop began as a vernacular form of lyrical improvisation in urban black communities and over time cultivated its own stylistic conventions with increasing depth and complexity, guided by pioneers like Grandmaster Flash, Rakim, and Jay Dilla. These days, artists like Clipping, Backwash, and Kendrick Lamar are doing really interesting experimental stuff with the genre, engaging with its history and helping shape its future. It has all the hallmarks of an art music tradition, but even academics who literally study hip-hop probably wouldn't describe it that way. It just feels wrong somehow. I'll give you a couple seconds to consider why that might be. Got it? Alright, so here's the thing. Generally, when we say art music, we don't really mean anything as abstract as the cultivation of vernacular tradition or whatever. What we mean is the music of white European aristocrats and later music derived from it. The category of art music has nothing to do with style or sound and everything to do with power. The idea that Bach's Prelude and Fugue in C major is the same kind of music as Terry Riley's in C only makes sense if you don't actually listen to either one. This is why I think it's so important to understand how the concept developed. On the scale of human history, the category of art music is a relatively relatively recent invention, but we all grew up with it, so it's easy to assume that's just the way things always were. We as musicians forget the extent to which we're still living in the shadow of the Romantics. Now, that's not to say that every one of their ideas was bad. There's plenty of Baroque-era things I definitely wouldn't want to see make a comeback, but we have to understand that the way we talk about music isn't some law of nature. It's a choice some randos made a couple hundred years ago, and we can and should consider choosing differently today. But maybe I'm being too harsh. I'm sure I've already got plenty of comments from people very calmly explaining that I'm overreacting and art music is actually just a neutral descriptor, but if that's true, what does it describe? In researching this video, I found a lot of attempts to define away the problems with the term by giving it a specific objective sounding meaning, so let's take a look at those. The first and most common definition is that art music refers to serious, complex music that rewards close listening. With that <laughs> so yeah, we were going to talk extremely during the video about uh, all the problems and other possible definitions. But here, uh, what I find more interesting and more important to remember is what he talks about, the power relationship, you know, uh, of this term and this origin on the German nationalism, you know, Absolutely. which will be also a theme uh, in, uh, in the next video. So we'll skip to the last excerpt from this video. 48, no, 58. academia has a long history of ignoring any tradition that didn't come from white European aristocrats, and music theory is especially bad. And no, I don't think changing one term is going to fix all that, but the words we use matter. They tell people who we are and what we value, and when we say that only this one kind of music gets to call itself art, I don't think we're sending a very good message. One pro This phrase, uh, words really matter, you know, it's, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting, you know. Uh, and also, you know, he, he talks about jazz a little bit and we, uh, uh, I learned with, with Ralph, you know, uh, uh, about all the problems with the word jazz and we have videos about it on our channel and Yousef's, uh, uh, Yousef, uh, uh, vision about the term and so on, uh, but Basically, he's doing this more theor theoretical approach of the name art music. And uh, I separate just these three excerpts to be faster, but he goes really deep. So if you're interested, I really recommend you watching the video. 
You, you know, I had some questions about as I was as I was listening to this, these interviews, and I thought about the classifications, uh, how how these the, how this Western music has been categorized. You know, from even before Bach, you know, they 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 don't even talk about the Rococo period or the Gregorians and the blah blah blah. Uh, the, the 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 Baroque, the classical period, the Romantic period, the you know, I mean, these categ categorizations that they give this music, it makes me wonder. And I thought about this as I was listening. I said, I wonder what would uh, J.S. Bach think about the categorization that they gave him and they call him Baroque. What would he think about that? What would, um, you know, of course, we know, you know, the, these great German nationalist composers, which many of them were, and they put the, set themselves as being authorities on Western music. What would, uh, uh, you know, uh, Beethoven think about being called a romantic? Actually, well, they say, well, he was a classical composer, but then he crossed over into being a romantic composer. You think about all these categorizations that they do for uh, what they call art music. This funny to me. I'm just saying, what would they think these composers think about the, the, the categorizations that they have put them in and who categorizes who? You, th you see what I'm saying? And naming is very important. Naming, because th these, you know, until somebody says something about it or challenges it, it just stays, it becomes tradition. You know, when you look at the term classical, you know, and I, I did that, you know, I've done that on several occasions, but I said, well, classical actually now was a Latin term, classicis, which means class. It was a Latin term meaning timeless. You see, a class. And 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 then it 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 has morphed into the Greek and Roman tradition. And this is something that, and they didn't really have a have an idea what they were calling this classic. So they called certain books, they call literature, certain literature coming out of the Greek and Roman tradition, classic. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's really something that needs to be, that we need to uncover these things be, before we embrace them or we wonder why. Even if we don't embrace them, we wonder why this is. Okay, so that's my spiel for right now. How are you, Junan? Come right in. <laughs> yes. So we'll go to the next video. These will have you. longer inserts because he has an outstanding uh, uh, argument and research. It's really amazing. He. Uh, provides all the sources in the description. So if you want to check it out, uh, also thanks to Ilham, we we uh, we also have uh, an article from the professor that he will be interviewing during this next video, and I'll be uh, I'll make sure to make it available on the description of the YouTube video if you want to read it out and check it out. So it's a very interesting video of Adam Neely called Music Theory and White Supremacy. You're online and you see the phrase music theory, try replacing it with the phrase the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians and see if it still makes sense in context. Here is an article that claims to explain the genius of Lady Gaga using the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. The article then goes on to highlight her song Bad Romance's use of the raised leading tone in a minor key, which was very popular in 18th century Europe. Very cool. This is a class that you can take all about the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians, and the way that you can tell is by looking at the course catalog, which has a lot of tonal harmony in it, which was very popular in 18th century Europe. This is a thread on the electronic music producer Deadmau5's subreddit, which asks, does Joel use 
the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians? Well, no, he doesn't use the same vocabulary that Mozart did, and he is very clear in interviews that he uses a different skill set. Do you self-identify as a tech guy or as a musical artist at this point? I think I'm more tech than, you know, Mozart or whatever the hell. What about need help understanding how this progression fits in with the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians? How many of you guys know the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians? Did the Beatles know much about the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians? Etc. Etc. You get the point. We see this all the time in popular media. We've been trained to see the two of them as the same thing. Even though the analytical models, the music theory, that might help in understanding the music of Beethoven might not help in understanding rock music, or country, or R&B, or electronic dance music, or any of the styles of music that you, the person watching this video, are statistically more likely to listen to and make part of your life than the music of Beethoven. Let me put it this way. What most people think of as music theory actually does a pretty bad job of describing musical practice in most styles of music. Instead, this has kind of been used as a means of comparing all music from all people across the globe to the stylistic practice of a select few musicians. These guys versus, say, I don't know, <sighs> these guys. So, can you spot the difference between the tonal composers on the left and the tonal composers on the right? That's right. The ones on the left are American. American. The ones on the right are German. And they clearly wrote the better music, which is why we study them. They clearly have the superior music. They clearly have a superior culture. They are individuals of genius who rise above the degenerate masses and their degenerate music. They are Part one the white racial frame of music theory. Hi, my name is Philip Ewell. I am an associate professor of music theory at Hunter College here in New York City. Dr. Ewell gave the keynote speech at the annual Society of Hull Music Theory conference. Our white racial frame believes that the music and music theories of white persons represent the best framework for music theory. It's part of everything that we do, white racial framing in music. All of the materials that we use in our music theory classes, for sure, are so deeply indebted to whiteness. In his paper, The White Racial Frame of Music Theory, Dr. Ewell says that music theory can be seen as a racial ideology in which the views and ideas of white persons are held to be more significant than the views and ideas of non-whites. Woo, okay. Racial ideology. That sounds like some critical race theory jargon, and as we've learned recently, that is un-American, so I don't want to talk about that too much on this channel lest we be accused of un-American activities. So to try and figure out why American music theory is not built around these American composers, we're going to focus on just the music. And we already kind of have done that. We saw how music theory in popular culture can simply just mean the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. And there are some musical elements which are unique to that style that are not shared in other styles, which are oddly prioritized. One thing I like to talk about, which because it's so funny, is figured bass. Figured bass is a system where numbers indicate intervals and chromatic alterations above bass notes. It's kind of like a 17th century shorthand, like chord symbols, a means of getting by on the gig. Musicians would read off of figured bass charts and improvise their parts, which was a practice called basso continuo, or simply continuo. And as a cellist who's played a lot of continuo with some really good Baroque groups, figured bass is something I live and breathe. I, I love figured bass, I understand it intimately. When we think about having it in our music theory textbooks, are you kidding me? Here is a music theory textbook from 1725, Johann Fuchs's Gratis ad Parnassum, which honestly does not look that much different from a textbook from 2011, Harmony and Voice Leading by Aldwer and Schachter. Nothing has really changed in 300 years, even though music has changed quite a lot. Uh, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov wrote a harmony textbook, uh, the most famous harmony textbook ever written in Russia, probably. And he said, you know what, music is so crazy these days, um, I'm not even going to put figured bass in here because it's kind of a waste of time. It's outdated. We don't need it anymore. That was 1884, Adam. Seriously, check this out. This is what Rimsky-Korsakov, the flight of the bumblebee guy, wrote. In most of the existing manuals of harmony, we find rules for reading the now obsolete figured bass, but little or no practical advice for harmonizing melodies or selecting chords. 
140 years ago. I mean, might as well be explaining this book or this book or this book. Like, nothing has changed in 140 years. We don't have to perpetrate a system which is, once you actually look at it, kind of ridiculous. Figured bass is totally useless in understanding any kind of music that isn't Western or tonal. Instead, it's a tool designed to understand the style of music from one kind of people. I now refer to it as, the, as an, yet another method that the white racial frame of music theory can police and enforce whiteness. They'll never say that. What they'll say is, oh, but it's historical and it can help with other things. There's, there's a reason that they're going to give for for everything, for keeping things the way they are. That's how it's justified anyway in the course catalog for AP music, th I mean, AP harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. But let's say that you were enrolled in AP Spanish, and the way that you were taught Spanish in this course was by studying 300 year old Spanish grammar. Now, studying these archaic tenses might be interesting, it's definitely historical. The way that they spoke Spanish back then definitely has influenced the way that Spanish is spoken around the world. And I don't know, if you already know a little bit of Spanish, maybe it might be useful for understanding Don Quixote or whatever, but is it useful? Is it practical for having conversations in Spanish in everyday life? Of course not. You might want to think about, in this entirely hypothetical scenario involving Spanish, why that practicality of having conversations in Spanish with cultures around the world is being sacrificed in the name of 300-year-old European Spanish grammar. What they are way more loath to acknowledge is the race, the whiteness behind it, and, and how that actually plays into their own thinking about this very history that we're talking about. When you think about the country, the United States, and you think about how structural race has always been, it wouldn't make any sense at all if a musical way, a methodology, for how we can envision and teach and experience music were not white racially framed as well in a country that itself is white racially framed. People are loath to admit that any culture with the music, which is every culture, has not only a rich musical tradition, but a rich music theoretical tradition. Aha. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> now, really quickly, let me put this. The term classical music comes from the Latin word classicus. Classicus, which means it is translated as belonging to a class. Okay, I shall pull myself out of that and you go on and continue. Yeah, so the next part of the video is about alternative music approaches or theories and so on. Uh, we're gonna skip the, the first one, which is about Northern Indian uh, uh, musical traditions and it's amazing. I really recommend you to watch the whole thing, but we're gonna skip to, uh, Another alternative perspectives uh, on, on on music theory or on what would be more useful to be applied in, in some kind of uh, music, more contemporary music, as he's going to explain. When there are, in fact, many. Part 3, minor 7, flat 5. People who are not white men. George Russell is a teacher as well as a composer. You were associated specifically with adventures in tonality. George Russell was a mixed race jazz musician who wrote a very influential jazz education method called the Lydian Chromatic Concept, otherwise known as the Lydian Concept of Tonal Organization. This I think you must explain. There are essentially two kinds of tonal gravity. Vertical, that is tonal gravity inferred by the chord, where the chord infers the tonic and horizontal tonal gravity. Tonal gravity inferred by the scale, for instance, a blues scale. His New York Times obituary describes it as a way for jazz musicians to improvise in any key on any chord without sacrificing the music's blues roots. His system does not use the major scale as the primary method of organizing harmony and instead uses the Lydian scale 
which ended up being very influential on Miles Davis with his modal jazz approach on Kind of Blue, which was the greatest selling jazz record of all time. His ideas of the Lydian chromatic concept have gained traction at some universities like New England Conservatory, for example, but jazz in general has a long tradition of non-white theorist educators who have attempted to codify the language of bebop, like David Baker, for example, and of course, the absolute legend himself, Barry Harris. I borrowed the diminished notes. Now watch. Barry Harris is famous for his work with what some people call the bebop scale, or the major scale with an added sharp five, but what he calls the sixth diminished scale. At tomorrow, everybody should know all the six diminished scales. But see, diminished notes, diminished notes are weird notes. They say, they say, move me somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they really do. They say move me. His approach to tonal harmony is both idiosyncratic and also incredibly useful for jazz improvisers and anybody who wants to improvise within tonal harmony. When you hit the major seven, watch. Now, we think of that as a complete chord, but really that chord is saying, that's what it says. See, a major seven really is a six with one diminished note. George Russell and Barry Harris developed their systems for jazz improvisers. But since jazz harmony is largely tonal, as well as a lot of European classical music, there is no reason why you couldn't simply adopt their systems to look at the music of Chopin, or Beethoven, or Brahms, or Mahler, or any 19th century European classical composer. It's just that nobody has done that before. And honestly, to me, it just makes a lot more sense to analyze Chopin through the sixth diminished scale than it does through figured bass. We've only seen music from this angle, and it's been a white angle, and it's been a male angle, and together, not or, but white and male. And we've completely put everything else out. We've excluded everybody else. I mean, nobody should really sit there and say that this didn't happen. That's just what music theory is. One very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, at this point, uh, uh, I would let you ask uh, you to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, these music musicians and music theorists that put it this way that he mentioned, you know, uh, George Russell, Barry Harris, but also uh, Eddie Harris, because, you know, in our private, private conversation, once you talked about him and his influences on Miles, and it was so wonderful that I think, you know, uh, other people deserve to know a little bit about this. Could you talk a little bit about this? Well, you know, um... <clears throat> Let me say this really quickly, too. The great Don Cherry said that style is the death of creativity. Think about that. Think about that. Style is the death of creativity. And that, that sentence holds a lot of uh, truth to it. Uh, when we look at the, you know, one of the things I think that so many of the great musicians uh those from the past, you know, going back to Duke Ellington, you know, who did not uh, embrace the term jazz and he did not em embrace the word that they called his music. They called his music jungle music. So you could go to that and look at that. Well, why, why did they, of course, we know why they did call it that. But when we look at people like Barry Harris, people like, you know, everybody was studying and they were extracting what they learned and they were developing their own concepts and their own ideas of what to do with this great music that they were doing. Charlie Parker, of course, he was listening to Verez and he was listening to, you know, the, the you know, and the, the, but you know what? He listened, but yet he developed his own music, his own uh, concept, I'm going to say concept rather than style. You know, uh, Barry Harris, who loved Bud Powell, also developed, he listened so thoroughly to this. And, and, and you know, I've, I've, I've listened to a lot of his interviews, which are on YouTube. And if you get an opportunity to listen, if you're not a musician, it's okay, because he still talks about embracing a musical concept. You see, and he could play anything. And he also talked about, he said, well, you know, um, our music is classical music. That's what he called it. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, 
I had a problem with that. You don't have to believe in everything that everybody tells you, but you can you can question it. Well, why did he do that? You know, modal music, you know, and, and to say that um, George Rus Russell was biracial, what did that have to do with anything? What what did that have to do with anything? With his with his with his mind, with you know, with his musical concept, the Lydian uh, music theory, uh, theoretical system. You see, so systems. We look at systems and we look at concepts. You know, not style. You see, style. You know, what is a style? Styles come in like clothes. They come in and then they leave. You see, and then another style comes in. So it tells you something about this uh, death of creativity when we embrace styles rather than concepts uh, uh, and ideologies, I should say. Um, yeah, very interesting about music theory because as we think about very deeply, every culture has a music theory. You see, every culture, however, every, every culture does not write down their music theory. It's oral. It's an oral tradition. You know, there's a, there's a, 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 a musical tradition to the blues, okay? You know, there's something very deep about what, and it's, you know, if people would... Uh, I should say uh, some people will transcribe things so they can understand it, but it's not given to us that way. The, the blues was not given to pass down through books uh, of theory and books of how to listen. You know, it was passed down through an oral tradition. It was also created from auto uh, from the system of autodidactism, teaching yourself, you see. And this, th these concepts are very, are looked down on by Europeans because they're, everything is written. You know, when you go to a symphony orchestra, they're reading music, you know, and you take the music away from them and say, play the music, they'll be lost. Many of them, they need a conductor. They need somebody to tell them what to play. You see, I don't think anybody told Muddy Waters what to play. He, it, you know, it was in him and it came out that way. Let, let's move on. I, I don't know if I answered that, but you know, I just have some, some, some thoughts and ideas about some of these things that, that they're talking about. Yeah. You have said something interesting. Uh, I will no longer hear classical music from the same year, uh, and that's that's true. You know the idea. You know we love classical music. What's called classical music, I love it. You know, uh, my first contact with music was through Mozart, for example. It's not uh, in any way, uh, you know, uh, talking about. Uh, uh, saying that is a bad thing or something like that. It's just an understanding that some concepts, as Ralph just brilliantly said, you know, they, they stick with us, you know, and uh, they create our perception of the world, you know. So that's the, the whole idea. And let's move to the next, uh, next excerpt, which is about the so-called universality of music you know adam will defend that there's no such a thing and he will explain and neither is music part four major seven music is not a universal now hold on donald there's this deep sense that music is somehow above culture. You like music, don't you? That music is transcendent, like mathematics. It's universal. Math is math. Math is math. Music is music. Let's go to ancient Greece. 
to the time of Pythagoras. Pythagoras is widely hailed in popular culture as the father of both mathematics as well as music. Mathematics and music? Music was taught as part of the quadrivium in medieval Europe alongside astronomy, geometry, and mathematics. Music was number in time, geometry was number in space, and astronomy was number in space and time. That makes a kind of sense, right? Or at least that's how Europeans have traditionally thought of it. There was this concentrated push in 1960s Cold War America to make the language of music theory more like a hard science and less like an art, to return it to the mathematical purity of the quadrivium. From this harmony in numbers developed the musical scale of today. The composer theorist Milton Babbitt would try and make testable statements about musical compositions, and Benjamin Boritz took that a step further and attempted to use formal logic to make meaningful musical statements. Not sure if he succeeded, but that does look impressive, I guess. The Pythagoreans, with their mathematical formula, came the basis of our music of today. The push to make music theory more and more objective had the effect of erasing any trace that it ever had a white European cultural perspective, because, after all, how can mathematics have a cultural perspective? It's just math. Math is math! People who want to believe in race neutrality, they want to believe in a colorblind society. Why do you always have to make it about race? Stop talking about race so much. It's not about race, it's just about good music. There's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. That is kind of impossible to do, because different cultures, ethnicities, and races might value different things in music, and also might not agree on what music actually is. Dr. Kofi Agawu points this out in his paper on the West African bell pattern. Imagine, if you will, a New World Order in which African approaches to rhythm pedagogy predominated in the American Academy. No one would be granted a music degree who could not dance. <laughs> so, yeah, I certainly would not be able to graduate from this academy. It feels kind of off, right? But for a West African musician, that might just be kind of common sense. Dance is essential for understanding the layered metric structure of many African styles, and it can also help with performance. This is backed by neuroscience. Studies show that body awareness and movement is essential for how all humans perceive metric structures. Embodied cognition of music is at the very foundation of rhythmic and musical understanding in humans, so why wouldn't dance be required of every musician? Like, seriously, why don't we do that? Philosopher Robin James calls the intentional separation of analysis from culture the epistemology of ignorance. The practice that naturalizes the common sense intuition of the most privileged members of society as objective knowledge. We see the separation of analysis and culture in popular media all the time. Like, for example, when conservative pundit Ben Shapiro explains why, in his estimation, Hip-hop is not music. In, in my view, and the view of my music theorist father who, who went to music school, there are three elements to music. There is harmony, there, mm -hmm. is, there is melody, and there is rhythm. Okay. And rap only fulfills one of these, the rhythm section. And so it's not actually a form of music, it's a, it's a form of rhythmic speaking. This argument oh, is hold actually- Hold it right there, hold, hold that right there. Hold it right there. That's part of the problem, is somebody saying that this is not music, you know, and it only fulfills a certain, you know, and my father went to music music school. That's because your father could afford to go to music school. Yes. Continue. Entitled Jazz and Jazzism, which rails against the dangers of jazz. Jazz is the brotherhood of those who, devoid of harmonic and even of melodic instinct, love to fairly wallow in noise. It is a manifestation of a low streak in man's taste that has not yet come out in the civilization's wash. I'll take that as a badge of honor. Now, we could show that black American music like jazz and hip hop do indeed use melody and harmony, but we don't even need to do that to show that Ben Shapiro's argument isn't great. Let's say, hypothetically, so let's say, let's say, for the sake of argument, there is a Ben Shapiro in a society that framed African ideas of music as objective knowledge. In this case, his music theorist father, who, who went to music school, went to the kind of music school that Kofi Agawu described. In this case, Ben Shapiro would not consider Bach chorales to be music because you couldn't dance to them. Dance is an essential quality of music, as everybody knows, as neuroscience proves, and so Bach chorales objectively are not music. 
argument doesn't really make sense. It's a bad argument, but it's no worse than Ben's 100-year-old racist view on black music. Much to my disappointment, there are still people in music theory, I wouldn't say who are white supremacist, who are white supremacist adjacent. They still believe it. They just, they know they can't say it. You'll very often see articles where Western music theory is framed as a tool for proving a piece of music's worth. That piece that we checked out at the beginning about Lady Gaga argues for Lady Gaga's genius using music theory and uses the stylistic practice of white Europeans as evidence of genius, like the Ray's leading tone. I'm honestly not sure how this is evidence of transcendence for a fun popular song, but okay. Another article from the same author argues, The reason Teenage Dream went to number one and remains in radio rotation is that it's a textbook example of the excellence and supremacy of the rules of Western music theory. So. Yeah, it's right there. You don't actually have to look very far for evidence of white supremacy in music theory. William O'Hara points out that these kinds of articles, these think pieces, frame music theory as a kind of hidden knowledge that you can use to identify genius. O'Hara parallels this practice to the work of Henrik Schenker, who used his theories of analysis in the early 20th century as a means of identifying genius in the works of Beethoven and Bach. Which means, that's right, everybody. It's time to talk about part five, seven, flat nine, sharp nine, flat 13. Heinrich Schenker, I guess. If Beethoven is our exemplar for a music composer, Schenker is our exemplar for a music theorist. Heinrich Schenker, 19, uh, sorry, 1868 to 1935, arguably the most influential music theorist in American music theory. So in the United States, if you want to get a graduate degree in music theory, I know, there are tens of you. You gotta study the theories of Henrik Schenker. American music theory has very deep Schenkerian roots. David Carson Berry traces the popularity of Schenker's ideas of music in America for a desire in the 1930s for more objective musical criticism, which bears more than a little similarity to pop culture think pieces which appeal to the supremacy of the rules of Western music theory today. They're both born from Schenkerian ideals. He came up with ideas about how the structure of music theory plays out from a background structure to, and a middle ground structure and a foreground structure. So this background structure came uh, in only a couple of varieties. It essentially had a motion from a tonic to a dominant to a tonic chord that could play out in two bars or it could play out in 200 bars or 500 bars in a, in a movement by Beethoven or Mozart. You know, um, and I'm going to just say this too, because, you know, my thoughts are running rapid, rampant as I, I'm listening to, to these, um, this, to this discussion. And, you know, I think about how, we listen to music. I think about how we are relegated, you know, when they say serious music, serious music, music that, in other words, when we go into an orchestral uh, 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 venue and we're listening to an orchestra, you're not supposed to react in any way. You have to be totally quiet and they call this serious music. However, if you notice from the first, from that orchestra from Bahia, those kids are dancing and playing. So why is it that there's music that we have to hear with no reaction, no human emotion to this music whatsoever? How do we listen to music? You know, sometimes we're listening to some music, you gotta pat your foot, snap your finger, to this music, and yet when we go to hear, uh, uh, you know, Hindemith, right? You have to be quiet. And if you clap between movements, they may ask you to leave the auditorium. Think about that. How do we listen to music? It's very important. Okay, go ahead, continue. I'm sorry. I just, you know, these things come to my mind and I have to talk about serious music. What's yeah. serious music? Oh, thank you, Ralph. Thank you so much. And uh, also, in the first video, we didn't play this part, but he also talks about the concept of serious music. So it's also interesting. Yes.
reality. When you watch these videos, though, you start to realize that the concept of figured base is absolutely essential in understanding Shankarian analysis, as well as the idea of continuo. It becomes clearer why there is figured base everywhere in all of our music theory textbooks. It's because it's all a system designed to teach Shankarian ideas from the ground up. It's actually pretty explicit in... One second. The preface to this book, Harmony and Voice Leading. This book reflects the theoretical and analytic approach of Henrik Schenker. The book will provide a valuable preparation for the later study of Schenkerian analysis. The problem is that Schenker is not useful in understanding any other style of music besides Western classical music. You can't do Schenker to Meshuggah, for example or James Brown, or Anuja Kamat's music. And even within the Western canon, Schenker does not do a very good job of explaining rhythm, or timbre, or any other musical element. Dance, if we're going to adopt the African worldview. We've built music theory from the very ground up with the idea that the only music worth analyzing and worth having a language of analysis for is the music that this mustache liked to analyze. And if you can't analyze music through his theories, then it isn't music. It's not worthy of your time. It's inferior. You can't do music theory to it. This is the legacy of Ben Shapiro and his music theorist father who, who went to music school. Western music theory has developed a language that attempts to show white culture superiority over non-white cultures under the guise of objective analysis. It's all a system designed to show white supremacy over non-white culture. And if you think that's me being hyperbolic or speculative, no, that's exactly what Schenker set out to do with his theory of music. He said very explicitly, I think of music like I think of people. I have a unified worldview. There's a hierarchy. White people are at the top. There's a hierarchy. The foreground is at the top. Also, the, the 11 or 12 composers are clearly at the top. And then he always used the word genius. Genius was code for white. It was also code for German. In his essay, Schenker the Regressive, the conductor Leon Botstein would write, The fact that Schenker, an observant and active member of the official religious Viennese Jewish community, adhered to these views and propagated them indicates how deep-seated was the sense of German cultural superiority within German-speaking Europe and how widely it was internalized. So the most controversial part is not saying that Schenker praised Hitler in a letter to his pupil Felix Eberhard von Kuba in May of 1933, four months after Hitler ascended to the Chancellery. It's not that Schenker said, the Jews are the greatest enemies to Germany, and he was Jewish himself. It's not that he said, even Negroes think that they can govern themselves. No, it's not that he said these horrible things that we must, that the white mate race must annihilate these Japanese animals because they're Japanese. No, it's not that he said all of those things. No one's going to dispute that. That's all out there. Carl Schachter, the guy who co-wrote this Harmony textbook that we keep referencing, wrote that for Schenker, both his political and musical ideas were armaments in a cultural struggle that would eventually lead to a regeneration of both music and society at large in the German-speaking world. Whew, okay. <laughs> now things are getting serious. Uh, music theory's intellectual framework is built on Germany's cultural struggle of the 1930s. That's... That's good. Karl Schachter continues, Schenker believed that an aristocracy of some sort, at least in cultural matters, if not also in political structure, would promote the selection and support of gifted individuals among whom the rare genius might emerge. That he was altogether wrong in this last view, I'm not prepared to say. Wait a second. Schachter agrees with Schenker. Are music theorists... Is music theory like a... Our roots are white supremacist. We uh, have created racist policies based on that simple racist idea that whites are superior. Dr. Ewell is not the first person to suggest that ignoring Schenker's racist ideas is not an option. Leon Botstein would also say in his essay, Schenker's notion of superior culture as an instrument for civilizing the rest of the world, when placed in the context of such forceful prejudices and contempt, demands scrutiny. I have taught Schenker analysis, I know it very well, always got A's, always liked it, and I completely shoved it all under the carpet for my career. That was a bitter pill for me to swallow. Think of how hard it is 
for someone to swallow who's, who's invested way more than I have, and there are many. The people who have devoted their careers, their, their energy, their you know, toil to, uh, to a field um, don't want to see it uprooted. They don't want to see their work undone. It's very difficult for that person to look into a mirror and say, race exists, whiteness exists, we've been rooted in pushing whiteness, and whiteness has had the leg up this whole time. And, and there have been other non-white groups who have been greatly disadvantaged. Part six minor. Let, let, let me answer a question that you had on, that you mentioned to Juan, why music theorists don't want to lose their academic status and privilege. That's because yeah. they want to get paid. They want to continue to make money and hold on to the monetary tradition that this music affords them. Okay, I'm gonna say that. Let's go ahead. Yeah, we're moving to our next, uh, our last excerpt. Uh, and uh, I'm just uh, uh, want to say that I'm gonna skip a part that Professor Ewell says, uh, it, uh, talks about a boycott that he suffered uh, in a uh, university from Texas that made a uh, like a conference about Shakarian uh, theory and uh, I really recommend you to watch this. I almost included it, but it was getting too long, so I didn't. But uh, you know, uh, this professor who is being interviewed suffered real consequences in his life, you know, because of uh, all, all that. So the last excerpt is more like a conclusion of these ideas. And uh, yeah, let's play this. Yeah, it's already way too long, but I do want to mention a couple of things that have been glaringly omitted from the script so far. The first thing, of course, is the relationship of music theory to class. It costs money to go to music school, and not everybody has the ability to go to music school, the place where you learn this harmonic style of 18th century European musicians, and so knowledge of music theory can be kind of a class signifier. In the United States, anyway, the relationship between class and race is very clear, so this white racial frame of music theory affects class as well. Now, you might notice also that I've been talking about the United States primarily in this video, which is rather ironic in a video about the Eurocentrism of music theory, but I can only personally speak to my experience. And in my experience, I did not learn the music of Beethoven through the lens of Barry Harris and George Russell, people of color. Instead, I learned figured bass, which is all a system designed to teach Schenkerian analysis, which was a theory explicitly designed to teach German cultural supremacy. I didn't learn the basics of Ottoman or North Indian or Japanese or African music theory as a foil to Western theory, and I certainly did not learn how to dance in music school. I don't imagine my teachers were explicitly white supremacists in their view of music theory. Well, most of them anyway, but that doesn't mean that the system itself that they had to work with wasn't structurally biased towards the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. And that's what makes racism structural. Sorry to bring in the critical race theory, by the way. I know if you're watching this now, you might be on some kind of future blacklist for anti-American activities, but here we are, everybody. Institutional racism is a bitch, and music theory plays a part of it. Here is me eating free. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of, uh, you know, of information, but we can see how in both videos, you know, we have this tonics of aristocracy, uh, a power, uh, interest of keeping things this way. As Ralph just said, also the money, of course, follow the money. <laughs> and uh, it's right there, you know, so I, I just wanna make a comment about this college access that for me is one of the most important things because now we're talking about real life issues for musicians, you know, who have to have a degree to teach or, you know, to be, have a better approach in some places and to get better chances and opportunities, you know, and 
Of course, you don't have to go to college to be a musician, but it opens a lot of opportunities. Of course, you don't have to read music to uh, to be a musician, but also restricts you from opportunities if you don't, you know? Uh, and he talks about college access and he went to Berkeley, you know? And I'm from Brazil, you know? Uh, and it's the same thing here in Rio is the same thing you have to learn. The only harmony uh, class that you have in college is figured bass. You know, it's the only thing you learn. And come on, man, we have samba, we have bossa nova, we have, you know, for hall, we have plenty different approaches of music and harmony. And, you know, you learn that, you know, it's absurd. And also, Ilham, I, I, uh, I want to uh, invite you to talk about it because when we were meeting to do this live stream, you said something very interesting also about the college access in Morocco. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even in France also. Um, but you find some professor, the, for example, Eric, he, he teach uh, differently. In Morocco, for example, when you want to study instrument, however, it can be guitar, piano, or what else, you have, uh, first of all, to uh, learn one year uh, solfege, and then you can play your instrument, the instrument you choose to, to play. And, uh, yeah, and uh, for that, the, for, um, it was my experience. I wanted to learn guitar uh in Casablanca and they told me that uh, now I cannot touch my instrument I have just wait for that one year and after solfege then I can play guitar for me it was making uh, any sense you know it was crazy I want to play guitar <laughs> and it still and doesn't here, make sense right still yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, also here, uh, also here in Rio, we have this school called Villa Lobos, which is which was a great composer and music educator in Brazil. And beside all his, you know, libertarian vision on music and so on, the school has the same process as Ilham just described. You know, you have to do uh, six months of just music theory before you can even touch an instrument. How absurd is that, you know? And uh, yeah, you know, it's this kind of things that Adam was talking about, that, you know, we are talking about. And uh, uh, if someone has a commentary, just please put it in the chat. But uh, also, uh, Anne Smith uh, wrote a commentary uh, on uh, our YouTube chat. She said, the need to quantify it and qualify something is revelatory. It is supremacist based praxis that relies on commodification and assigning value. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Um, but yeah, uh, also uh, some other thing that it's a consequence of of all that is uh, what we are we just talk about a little bit, but is about you know the opportunities that we are restrict in our lives you know uh, as musicians when you don't have access to university and so on. So for example, this makes this automatically you know any musician who wants to play anything that is not what, what it's called classical music, who wants to play blues, rock and roll, samba, anything, they have two options. Or they submit their knowledge to this kind of approach of classical music, or they look for another path to do, but they know that this path is going to be more difficult, you know, if you want to teach, if you want to do anything like this, you know. You also, let me say this too. You often hear people say, and you know, it, it makes me regurgitate. It makes me want to throw up every time I hear it. 
because people say, well, you know, I'm classically trained. Well, uh, as that is a badge of validation that people wear, I'm classically trained. You know, how many people say, well, you know, I'm John Coltrane trained. I am trained by the blues. I bet, no, John Lee Hooker, you know, I'm blues trained. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, especially about music and especially where we are right now with this music that we, that we have embraced, you know, and this, this calls for us to go deeper into these areas, you know, also, you know, and we, if we get the opportunity and we will carry the, these conversations further to get musicians that have taken, I'm talking about musicians from the diaspora that from the African, African diaspora that have gone the way of so-called classical music and the, the, the challenges that they met, you know, when they were the only ones out of 90 people, you know, one of two, two or three people out of 90 people, what did they go through? You know, when, when the conductor looks back there and he said, well, God, what are you doing here? Let's think about that. What are you doing here? Why are you, you know, let me hear you play. I don't believe you can play. Well, here you go, you know, you go to the third violin. The Detroit Symphony, which was a really great symphony, they had one Black musician for like 30 years, Joe Stripling, the violinist, and they kept him in the back, almost hidden. You see what I'm saying? And he could really, really play. Of course, he wouldn't have even been in there if he couldn't. But there's a lot of stories that go on about people that have been embraced that music to go that way. And what did they have to what did they have to deal with when they said, well, I want to I want to I love this music. I want to, you know, I like I like that music as well. I'm going to say that. But you know what? You know, it's not going to validate me and, and who I am and what I do. You see, that that's not going to validate me. I share. Yeah, I share. <laughs> that really specs, uh, speaks about the common sense, you know, yeah. uh, on uh, on all of that that we we're discussing, you know. So what well, what is the conclusion? And also, either of the videos come to a conclusion uh, on the name uh, itself, and neither we we was. <laughs> But uh, as Ralph said, we this uh, this subject is very extensive. We can talk in other live streams about it. Also, we want to do a live stream about the term jazz. But as I said, we have videos on, on it in our YouTube channel. You can check it out. But uh, for me, these, these kind of things, uh, you know, for, I've heard many times, <laughs> Ralph, uh, you know, oh, you're a musician. What instrument do you play? Oh, I play the guitar and and play the piano. Oh, okay, the piano is a serious instrument, you know. Uh, uh, you know, as the uh, <laughs> as the guitar wasn't, you know, and you know the, this name's popular instrument. What is a popular instrument, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well listen. Let me let, let me add on to that too, Juan. When sometimes when people see meet greet meet you as an African American. And you say, oh, you play, uh, oh, you're a musician, huh? Oh, you play jazz. That's the first thing they say. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you play jazz. Oh, you play jazz. They never say any other kind of music. You play jazz. Really? They don't know anything about you or what you think about, but they assume the assumptions. Well, you must, you, they, they never say, well, you know, you play the blues. <laughs> You play a uh, uh, rock and roll. Uh, you play country western. You know, but when they meet you, the first thing is, oh, you must play jazz. <laughs> and we will talk about that. You see? Yeah. Uh, I forgot to say that, but just to to finish, uh, also uh, uh, here in in Portuguese, you know, here in Brazil. Uh, we even have have another term that for me is even more problematic, 
which is erudit. We call it erudit music, you know, as something that is intellectual and, you know, it's basically the same thing, <laughs> yeah. but it's to correct the historical mistake of calling classical music something that is not just in the classical period, but we could, you know, uh, call some uh, contemporary composers classical music. But it is the same problem, you know, it is the same feeling. But yeah, I think uh, that's it, right, Ralph? Uh, just, uh, you want to say something else or we could do the announcements? You know, um, listen, thank you very much. And, you know, um, I think these are very, uh, very uh, wonderful topics to, to discuss. You know, as you know, we, we take music for granted often and we don't we don't really often talk about what are the ramifications of the names that music is given, uh, the people that that play the music. You know, one of our seekers um, would talk about often often it, Nelson Harrison, he, Dr. Nelson Harrison, he often talked about listening, about how we hear. You see, taking away the 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 performance part of, of that, but we have to hear it first. You know, the music that we hear, music goes inside of us and it stays inside of us sometimes, you know, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, we have to we have to be able to hear, you know, which is something very uh, undervalued. You know, um, I have a book on my bookshelf right now that was written in 1950s, and it's called The Psychology of Music, where they set up tests to give to children to see if they were qualified to, to do music. Think about that. Think about that. You see, and, and, and you know, uh, I hope that one time we will, you know, get deeper into that, the psychology of music and you know what defines what define you know I remember young musicians well don't give them a a, a trumpet because his lips are too big or don't give him a flute because their lips are too big what you see so there's all kinds of things that are rolling around that nobody hardly ever addresses you know and these things still happen believe me they still happen in in universities they still happen in, in primary schools with kids, which is why they've taken the arts out of the schools here, you know, or it's, it's diminished to such a point where, you know, kids don't have, have the uh, opportunity because they push STEAM, you know, engineering, which is important as well. But what about the arts? Because as they say, who said that uh, the arts make you human? That's true. That's very true. And should I should I go into the uh, announcements? Should I do that or? or? Yeah, uh, just uh, real quick. Uh, Junian just said a session on music therapy would be great. Yeah, music therapy, absolutely. You know, for your spirit. <laughs> yeah. So for our seekers, yeah, let's do the announcements about next module. We have a date, and we're really. Happy to announce it. And uh, just real quick, brother, if, uh, before we talk about next module and the theme and so on, uh, we're going to move this live stream to Tuesdays because we're going to start the next module and they're going to happen on Thursdays. But Ralph is going to talk uh, better about this. Well, our, uh, our, pl our plan is this. We are going to start our, uh, actually our 15th, or is it our 16th module of Aesthetically Speaking Music. And uh, we're going to start with our open house. And I think I mentioned this briefly last week, but we're going to start on the 18th of April. And that will be our open house. Uh, we're going to do our lot, continue our live streams and they will be on Tuesdays. So we will have a live stream on Tuesday and we'll, ha we'll have our ASM module on Thursdays. We'll do it one day a week. Uh, well, good to see you, Ann Collins Smith, as always. 
Um, so, 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 yeah, that's what you know. One of the things that we have have to look forward to. We will do ASM, um, our our module, fifteenth module, I believe it is. I'm not certain. Uh, we seems like we've been doing this a long time, but um, you know, on the eighteenth of of April, that will be our open house, and we want as many people as we can to join us on that, and we will talk about. We're going to be doing and looking at the music, the dance, the clothing and hairstyles, the regional phenomena of African-American popular music. So we're going to be talking about not only, well, primarily pop popular music, which we will delve into uh, the music, uh, disco music. And what happened after the disco music faded out, we had, you know, hip hop was born. So we're have, looking at a whole evolution of these different musics that are happening from the period of 1973 until 1980. You know, I know that's going back some years and some, some people have not even, weren't even born during this period. However, this is a very crucial time in our musical evolution. And we're gonna talk about the people that made it revolutionary, made it revolutionary uh, during that period. Uh, clothing styles, uh, hairstyles, uh, dance styles, um, you know, uh, singing styles, groups, uh, music groups began to fade out to a degree. The solo artist came in, you know, and did did more things during this period, but we will we will get into that in our next module and uh, just look forward to that. And we will continue to remind you of uh, when our open house will be. Yeah. yeah. So just to make it more clear to everybody who who is watching us now or will be watching in the future because this video will be available in our YouTube channel. Uh, also, Junian. Uh, is a little bit confused about this. She said that she thought this was the open house, but uh, no. So uh, we created this formats of live streams, and they are more diverse subjects. You know, we had some great interviews. You can check it out also in, in our channels. We had different topics, and they don't have a relationship between each other, but. Uh, so we're going to start our next module. And for those of you who aren't yet uh, a seeker uh, and want to join us, these sessions happen on you on, uh, here on Zoom. And it's, uh, it's exclusive on Zoom, uh, except for the open house, which will be public and open for everyone. And I think we can live stream the open house on YouTube as well. But after the open house, only exclusive people who want to be a seeker and to dive deep into these uh, subjects that Ralph just described about the music of 1973 to 1980 and so on will be more uh, delve into this subject. But the live stream will still continue every Tuesdays with different topics. Yes, ASM. Aesthetically speaking, music, and we may at, at some point we will say aesthetically speaking, hip hop. We will say aesthetic. <laughs> we'll cover a whole lot of areas, and we'll talk about aesthetically speaking music theory or music theories. There's not just one music theory, folks. You know, all these, all, all of the cultures have their. You know, it made me wonder too as I was listening today, and I, I'm going to be quiet in just a bit. But it made me think about, you know, when we listen to traditional music from the continent, you know, this is they have their own music theory, but it doesn't come on a written page. It comes from teacher to student and listening and being taught that way. You know, oftentimes the drummers, you have to learn rhythm. You have to learn how to play the drums. You have to learn rhythm and you have to be able to sing. There's things that you have to do with this music 
and then before and then and you can pick up an instrument of course but there is a teacher discipline teacher student discipline that's very deep in these musical cultures and there are very few um academic schools where you can go and really get this this music truthfully so i'm going to stop while i'm ahead or i'm going to stop while i'm behind and i want to thank you all for joining us and junan thank you so much we will talk about music therapy but think about this we have been talking about music th therapy anyway because music will can 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 uh, soothe your soul music can can incite you to think music can incite you to to love somebody and music can also make you uh maybe not love somebody sometimes you know and it shouldn't but it does at any rate i'm, I'm gonna say good night to everybody yeah you got it one yeah just uh great session brother thank, thank you, you all for coming yeah there was a great session i loved it uh and uh important thing if you're watching this and uh, want to join us on our next module starting on april 18th yes uh, send us an email in uh aesthetically speaking music at gmail.com or go to our website which is in the description of this video and do this the inscription through our website but in the email, you're going to receive all the information as well. And uh, for those of you who are already are seekers, you're going to receive also the invitation for the open house with the link and everything. And yeah, thank you. Subscribe to our channel. Press the like button. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Adeyemi. <laughs> it's a great session indeed. Thank you, Adeyemi. Always, always. Thank you so much. I Peace. Think this is